Hi, everybody. Real <laughs> Welcome back to conventions. <laughs> Woo! Oh, God, there's people. <laughs> Real people. So, uh, my name is Christina Blanche, and I am going to moderate this amazing panel today. And um, I would say he needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. <laughs> Uh, we have with us, and then we'll just go down the line, and then Dirk, you like to talk, so you can go next. Um, we have Tony Schiavone. <laughs> and then the rest you can introduce yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so it begins. <laughs> Dirk Manning, the writer of Bunks and Seats, the Tony Giovanni story. <laughs> Mike Dawkins, I'm uh, Tony's lawyer and I'm kind of responsible for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gina Joe, and I'm the editor of this book. John Marquardt, I was the artist on one of the chapters of the book. And that's the panel. Um, Thank you for coming. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we have three masks. Um, so we're just going to kind of start talking with Tony. Uh, Butts and Seats is such a it's a it's a great book, and I know you're a comic book nerd. So, what was your reaction when you first saw yourself in the first pages of the comic? It's uh, it's. It's staggering, it really is. Uh, when I think about what my career has been and, and to see it in pictures was, and still is amazing. I, I, I continue to stare at the book and all the great artists and all the great drawings and the different artists that we have and, and take a look at myself as a comic book character is, it's freaking amazing. I, uh, you know, we obviously looked at a lot of the drawings, a lot of the sketches before the release of the book. And there's a lot of drawings of me. Yeah. And there's a lot of drawings <laughs> of my wife, Lois. <laughs> and I was shown to Lois. And Lois would say, that's not me. <laughs> and I would say, yeah, I know. It's a comic book drawing. <laughs> Okay, so just seeing the different uh, drawings of me is, is amazing, seeing it in pictures. And when we first started uh, talking about this, you get in your mind exactly what you think it's going to be, but it just kind of hooked your mind again to see it and see the drawings, see it in color. So it's been an amazing process, and it's something that it's going to, obviously the book is here, but it's something that first seeing it out, when I first saw the book, it was... Dirk handed me the book, uh, I believe it was at the New York Comic Con. New York Comic Con. Yeah. It was like, holy shit. <laughs> Look at this. Yeah, I just, uh, <laughs> it's just an amazing thing. It really is crazy. So, did you, when you were going through it, did you kind of look at it and go, dang, I've done a lot in my life? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it, it, it made me think about. Uh, because this uh, this book is about not necessarily my life; it's about my career. It it really starts. Well, it begins in in high school, but it begins when I first started watching and loving pro wrestling, and brings you all the way up until the present day. So that's what the story is about. And so it uh, it it made me uh, reminisce on my career and think about all the things that I've done in my life in wrestling and out of wrestling in the 18 years that I spent away from wrestling. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really something and uh, to see some of the, some of the moments uh, in my career that were, you know, there, there's been a lot of crossroads in my career and I'm sure every, everybody's had crossroads in their careers and in their lives and pretty much every important crossroad of my career have as is a, is a part of this book as far as my career my personal life is concerned because it has been a journey so it uh, it makes me think about how fortunate i am to be because my life has been a series of fortunate incidents where i've been in the right place at the right time 
and have made the most of it. So, and they're all part of this book. So it's it's quite an experience to see it all laid out in, in words and in drawings. So Dirk, I think that's as long as you've gone about talking. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. How did this uh, book come about? It was a process. <laughs> <laughs> So Mike Dawkins. <laughs> so Mike Dawkins got in touch with me and said, "Would you consider doing a comic book of your career?" I I'm not really was never in favor of doing a book about my career because books are a lengthy process, and I get that. And I've talked. I know people who've written books and they go put a lot of effort into that. And at my age, I don't want to put a lot of effort into that anymore. <laughs> so. Mike said, would you like to do it? You know what's coming, don't you? Okay. Just, just, just bring it up. All right. Here it comes. Okay. Wait, Mike said, would you like to do a comic book about your career? And I went, yeah, that's, I love comic books. I love superheroes. I love fantasy. I love sci-fi. Oh, absolutely. I, I would like to do it. And he said, well, it just so happens that I have a friend of mine who is one of the real good comic book writers out there. And I'll put you in touch with him to see if we can't get something going. I said, all right, let's do it. And then about three days later, Mike called me back. He says, well, that guy's not available. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so why don't you talk to Dirk Manning? <laughs> so that's kind of how it all started. I owe someone money. <laughs> and it's the type of person you don't want to owe money to. <laughs> so my friend Mike Dockers gets a hold of me and says, hey, I, uh, you know, I, I got this guy. And in fact, I actually, truth be told, uh, he was supposed to be at the last CD2 we had. And I think Mike's master plan was to kind of network Tony and I together because he said, you know, we got Tony Schmott. And I said, who? I said, no, your childhood. And I said, what kind of childhood did you have? <laughs> That's good. That's good. So I'm thinking you want to take three or four of these, Tony. I got it. It's how you finish. No, but um, yeah, Mike, Mike came to me as well and said, you know, I've been a lifelong wrestling fan. Even though primarily my output, comic book wise, has always been more horror stuff. I'm a very frightening person, as you can tell. <laughs> um, I'm an unabashed wrestling fan, even when it was perhaps not as cool to be a wrestling fan, you know, which I think a lot of us remember those days. People caught up. You know. And um, he goes, I want to, you know, I, I want to talk to you about maybe doing a, a comic book with Tony Schiavone. And in all seriousness, my comment was, my response was, I'd be willing to have that conversation. <laughs> and, and that's no slam on, on Tony at all, truthfully. But because working with real people on comics, which I've done before, I, I do Bobo Source Point Press for a long time. Uh, nominated for Ringo Award for Best Humor Comic of 2020. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure to mention it. Um, but it, it's, it's a complicated beast, you know, and it, it's really a thing that you really want to be careful. And my concern, and full disclosure, was I did not want to get wrapped up in a, a vanity project, knowing that it would be not a fictionalized version of Tony's life, but rather about his life. Then the other question became, am I going to be the right guy for this? Um, I had a series of events come up. I couldn't, first time, I, naturally, the first time in my career I missed C3-2 was last year. Mm. And I thought, well, that's okay. We'll catch up in the next count, and we'll all talk there. <laughs> Little did I know, not sure that the CG2 would break the timeline. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what ended up happening is we got on a call on Zoom. And, uh, and at that time, I think a lot of us were like, well, this will be a couple months that it'll blow over. <laughs> <Swear. laughs> the first Zoom call with Tony, though, became very evident that, that Tony is a very uh, humble guy. And, and in fact, I think honestly, initially we had to kind of pull the story out of Tony was kind of like, I, you know, life, book about my life and wrestling, okay, but what's that going to look like? And as we started talking, and, and, and Mike and I started kind of plotting this out a little bit and stuff like that, um, Tony's story is really, and I mean no pun intended here, like the American dream. You know? <laughs> You're welcome. 
It goes from <laughs> his being a kid and taking his family to their first ever live professional wrestling event to becoming an announcer, becoming a, a very well renowned announcer in the industry, falling out of love with it, leaving for almost two decades, mm -hmm. coming back and recognizing not only what a legacy he had, but now being part of a movement that is revitalizing the wrestling industry, not only in wrestling. That's the American dream. It's a very powerful story to tell. And, and what I quickly realized was, even though I myself am obviously a wrestling fan, I think this is a story that a lot of people that don't necessarily appreciate professional wrestling can get into. Because Tony's very, and, and Tony's very humble throughout this process, but, but what a story. What a story it was. And it, it was really exciting. Uh, we ended up doing the whole book creation on Zoom. It was late night Zoom calls, you know, we'd all get together. And at first, of course, we're all dressed up like this. You know, <laughs> stuff like that. Probably like call five, it's like we're in our pajamas. We're lucky if we have pants on. You don't need to wear another I now know what kind of boxers are going to be But it, it was a really good one. <laughs> Unwashed is the answer. <laughs> But, but it was a real cool process, and uh, we spent about a year doing the book on Zoom, doing Zoom calls, coordinating with the artists, and uh, here we are at C2E2, uh, next door round with, with the book present. So. so, Mike, what was your impetus to, like, what made you think, hey, we should, we should do a comic book, Tony? Yeah, it was it was a few things. Uh, I knew Tony's story, and I thought it was fascinating and interesting. I thought other people would want to hear it and see it as well. And we were at a dinner, and I think it was in Chicago, but after an AEW show or something. And I said, Tony, why haven't you ever done a book? Why haven't you ever done a biography? You told your story. Nobody wants to hear that, Mike. Uh, Tony, I think you're wrong. I think people <laughs> do want to hear it. I think it's a fascinating story, and I just don't wait. There's so much work that goes into it, and you know, it's such a hassle to write a book and. So do you know about this thing called Kickstarter? And you know, I know you're a comic book guy like I am, Tony. I think, I think people want to see it. And selfishly, uh, I wanted to kind of see the inner workings of, of how comic book creation works and writing it and working with the artists and all of that. Because I've been collecting comic books and reading them since I was a very little kid. And so that was what I wanted out of it, is I just wanted to see behind the curtain uh, <laughs> and, and see how, how the sausage gets made. And, so Tony said, well, that's interesting. And I, we talked about the Kickstarter thing. We talked about the dark and, and how this would all potentially work out. And Tony said, oh, you know, I'll think about it. And this was, a, I think, a Saturday night. And Sunday, the next day, I uh, get done with the convention, see my brothers, they live in town. We're heading out of town. I'm driving down the highway and my phone rings. I look down at Tony Schwani. Hey, what's up, T? What's going on? Make some introductions. I think I want to do this. <laughs> and that's, that's how it happened. That's awesome. Now, Drain on. You were an editor on this book, but you, it was a little bit different because with all the Zoom calls and everything, and there are real people involved, and you interviewed you know, Tony and his wife. Um, yeah. So how was, how was that process a little bit different than normal editing? Well, most times I don't have like one-on-one -on -one interactions with the subject <laughs> of the comic book. But it was like meeting a superhero for the first time for me, and I've been watching him since I was a child, and he was a hero of mine growing up. So um, the first meeting, like Dirk was saying, you know, we're all like super professional. My hair is all cleaved perfectly, <laughs> and I'm wearing a blazer. And then uh, he was super casual about it, and he was it was like you knew him your whole life within the first meeting, that the process of editing the story was probably one of the easiest I've ever had, honestly, because we had the whole team and everyone had a goal, and that was to tell his story and make sure it was correct. You know, that's how the process worked. I mean, I've worked with you, you know, you know, a lot of it is back and forth, back and forth, with storytelling and developing, and that really didn't have to happen on this book, this book was just making sure you know, everyone looked, you know, you wanted everyone to be in a good light. You don't want any negativity in a comic book like this. And so, for Tony, it was very easy because he's led a wonderful life. Yeah, so pretty easy. 
One of the really interesting things is that you didn't, you really didn't leave anything out. It's like, you know, you had some, some times when in life when it was hard. Right. And you didn't gloss over it and say, oh, everything's great. I mean, you, you right. showed how hard you worked and you kept it in there. Right. So is there anything that when you were getting interviewed and talking about that you kind of remembered that you hadn't remembered? Wow. Um, yeah, I had, uh, I had really, and this is kind of how the book started, I had forgotten about, I had remembered and about my times with Uncle John, who started my love of wrestling after my father had passed away. My father, my father passed away in 1974, and I, so I started watching wrestling with Uncle John in like 74, 75 after Dad had passed away. And I had remembered my times with Uncle John, but I had forgotten about my first wrestling show. And I had forgotten about how I bought the entire front row for inside for my, for my family. Uh, and I had forgotten that whole story. And Dirk said, that is a great story about how you how that you know, Uncle John and you used to watch wrestling together and and now you brought Uncle John to a show that he got physically involved in. <laughs> <laughs> as, chapter one, chapter one. Chapter one. And, <laughs> as eighty year old men who grew up in the hills of Virginia would do. <laughs> They thought wrestling was interactive. <laughs> <laughs> I had for, I had forgotten that. I had forgotten that that whole process, and all of a sudden it, it ties it together. So that that kind of started it that way, and uh, because as the, the older you get, and most of you are going to find out, the older you get, the less you remember. Okay, I do take supplements to help for this. Okay, they are legal supplements <laughs> <laughs> to help with my memory. But uh, the, the times that since I was married, uh, it's, it's easy to remember because those would remind me every day of some of the things. <laughs> but when you have to go back and think about some of the things happened in your life when you were younger and you have nobody to call on to say, do you remember that time? There's nobody there to say, oh yeah, and they can embellish on a little bit. But that, that came flooding back to me, that, that time. And that, that's, that's a very important, that's kind of the starting point of the book. And I didn't even think about that. So that that was one of those moments where it's like, wow, it all came rushing back because it was a great moment. It was a great moment of my life to see my Uncle John as a wrestler with his steel cane. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. And it, it, it happened in the 70s to where, you know, today would be front page news of the Harrisonburg Daily Record in Virginia. And, and now it was just one of those things that's, you know, in, in the memory. And Dirk was really good at coaxing memories from Tony. He had like a list of questions he would ask. And right. The stories would just start flowing. And it was at that point you would decide, okay, is the story going into the book or is the story not in the book? And this is just far little group. Right. There, there were, and there, there were some times that Dirk would, would have me go back and remember about my days at WCW. And if you remember, WCW did not end well for anyone. And the last couple of years of WCW were like probably the worst years of my life professionally. And you, you get that freaking amnesia. You do. Because you try not to you try to forget that stuff. Okay? And so he would pull that out of me. And some of the things that would happen uh, that happened back then. And I felt bad about it too, because you know it's like there's a part of the book where, where we end up keeping it in where I mean Tony's crying in the book. And I kind of felt like a monster to me, but I mean, but it was, it was important, you know, right. it, it was, it was part of the story. It was real. It was real. Yeah. Right. Well, what's, what's not part of the book, and, and just to show you how, uh, I, I wasn't really, I wasn't really uh, crying and upset because WCW was coming to an end. That was a relief. Right. But I was crying and upset because I knew I had five kids to support. Right. And true story, that's not the book, the day that WCW closed the doors and we all went in there and they told us, you know, it's, this is all done. Lois calls me and says, the three boys, three youngest boys, all needed braces that day. Oh. That day, okay. 
Uh, so uh, that's you know the the responsibility you have with having young children at that time uh, is is pretty steep. So that it was emotional. It really was uh, thinking about your family, but not thinking about WCW that is dead and gone. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorite parts of the, the, the story, the whole process was that early on Tony said, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna try to make myself look great, you know, and make twist every story so that I'm the superhero. I'm like this is, I'm gonna tell the truth. I'm just gonna tell my story in good, bad, or indifferent. And you know, I, he was very cognizant of, and we were as well. To Drina's point, you know, you don't want to bury anybody or make anybody look bad. At least not intentionally, <laughs> and we, we try to steer away from that. But Tony's like, it's all fair game for me. But whatever we want to put in, whatever we want to talk about, you know, I don't care. You don't have to make me look great because this right. was this is my life. This is what happened, and so that's a, a real credit to Tony. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I know we're going to get to the art in a second, but I do want to point too. Like one of the things that happened in our conversations was talk about memory. When we were talking about when. One of the chapters is when Tony first meets Lois, which is really a <laughs> whirlwind romance. And Tony tells the whole story, right? Talked about it. And uh, I think it was Brina actually that called up. She goes, I'd love to hear Lois's sound. Because <laughs> you know, again, it's a bunch of guys in the call, you know, and they want a bunch of meatheads. And somehow, through the Zoom call, Lois hears her name <laughs> comes rushing into Tony's bathroom. She doesn't rush anywhere. <laughs> she moved with great with great force and vigor. Uh, Tony took the second bump of his life. But Lois shoves him out of the chair, sits down, and retells the story from her perspective. Now let me tell you what really happened. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was it. And we ended up in the chat and the second chapter of the book, like one said, is like Lois literally shoves Tony out of the panel <laughs> and tells the story. And uh, Sally Scott, who was with us in the audience here, drew that chapter, which is amazing. <laughs> but when we get to the end of the towards the end of the story, the, the pivotal first date, I guess you'd call it, it's what was had for dinner. <laughs> And Tony said it was steak and broccoli. <laughs> and Lois said it was her famous fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm waiting to give the script to Sally. I'm like, um, and both of them are married to their narrative. And it's like, who do I want to piss on? Or Tony, who's writing the book for, or Lois, who is kind of frightening. <laughs> and I'm not going to spoil what we did in the book. Yeah, but, but that was a thing as well that, you know, it, it just became a very organic uh, process and, and having that vibe and, and telling the book. And, and kudos to you, Sally, for how you handle that as well. Because, uh, Stand up, Sally. Yay. 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 Really, honestly, wanted to name the chapter Lois is Full of Shit. <laughs> but she didn't, because there's no way a woman on the first date, unless she knew something, was going to take the time to make fried chicken. She just knew a steak right in the pan. How long after they date before you guys were married? Uh, about uh, two months. Chicken. <laughs> well, speaking of the art, um, one of the great things about this is oh, one of the great things about this is that um, uh, the art is different in every chapter. So we have an artist here. Um, you want to talk to us about how you approach this and were you a wrestling fan? You go, oh, this is great, or you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was when I was younger. Um, I, I probably out of the whole group of, I, I, I've known Dirk for a while, I've worked with him before, but out of our whole, uh, whole group, I'm probably the only one that doesn't know too much about wrestling. 
But uh, I did have fun. I got to draw Ric Flair and <laughs> Steve Dragon. And, yeah, it was great. And then just learning about uh, Tony from the book, which I didn't know uh, when I finally read the whole thing, was just amazing. The, the book is great. Glad to be a part of it. Yeah, because it's really, it's a book about wrestling, but it's not about wrestling. You know, it's about it's about making your way <laughs> through life and, yeah. and and not giving up. Right, because perseverance. You did not give up. No. I thought there was something else. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking because uh, not giving up, and then that makes me think about I'm sitting here uh, at C2E2, like I did at New York Comic Con, at a table, and I've got my my daughter Laurie with me and Megan with me. Helped me out tremendously. I couldn't do it without them. And I'm sitting at this table with all these comic books, and I'm looking at all this thing. And this is it's it still is surreal, and <laughs> it's it's about a journey that that this is not the end of the journey, but it feels like it's kind of like the icing on the cake of, mm -hmm. of your work. So you and I in New York went out and had dinner, and I, I asked him, I was like, "Tell me, have you ever sat back and looked at what's going on right now?" You know, you're 600 years old, and, <laughs> and you're, you're living your best life. You know, yeah. you, you thought wrestling was done and dead right over, and you're finished, and yeah. you've got a comic book, and you're as popular as ever. Yeah. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah, it's the greatest time of my life. Greatest time of my life. It really is. And uh, and I have uh, these people trying to do it. Occasionally, special guests like Lois or Cody Rhodes did run in one time. Like that, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. You know, it really, and I can only speak for myself, but I think I could also speak for all of us. It really helped get through a really rough time. You know, those Zoom calls were something that at least I, I look forward to a lot and to be able to create and, and do this book. Um, it, was, it was fun. And, yeah, and again, the, the journey was incredible. You know, it's like just to, to be here and to be working with Tony, a guy who supposedly was, was on television in the 80s, so I hear about you know, the other stuff. But There's a younger version of me. <laughs> <laughs> when I think about uh, another thing, it just brought up this when I think about my life, and I've had so many fans, so many people come up to the, the table this week and wherever we appear, and I often think of what I do for a living as non essential. Non -essential because I think that obviously uh, first responders and doctors, uh, at times lawyers, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, are the people who are important to the world. And I realize my niche in life that I always think that I'm just an announcer, I'm just a wrestling announcer. Uh, but when people come up and say to me that either your podcast or this book or what you do on AEW certainly has helped to help me during some dark times in my life, be it the pandemic or a personal tragedy, and they're sincere about it. Mm -hmm. I really that makes me that makes me feel great. That is, uh, I love hearing those stories because it makes me feel that what I've been doing in my life has been worth it. So, well, even Cody Rhodes when he popped in talked about how much of a fan he was, you know, right. how important you were to him. Right. And that was, yeah. that was important. That was sweet. Yeah, right. Oh, he's a good kid. Good kid. And he can read. That's what I give him. We put him in the book. Yeah, yeah that, that guy. Sure. <laughs> so, what did your kids think about it when they saw it? Uh, well, uh, Laurie, what did you think about it? Oh, I think it's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> it's awesome. it's yeah. all true. Yeah. Did, did you learn anything that um, you didn't know? No, because I've always had a close relationship with my father. So even like, you know, the hard times, he was always upfront about it. Like that part in the book where he sits us all down, like that happened. And, you know, he's always been a great father, always there for us, no matter what age we are. And it was going through a time when we were all adults and we all pulled together and helped our dad without question. Yeah. 
like to say, this all wouldn't have happened if I didn't get engaged. <laughs> so you're welcome. You're welcome. Yes. Very brief story. Uh, when in 20, she got engaged to Christmas 2016, right? Yeah, 2016. 2016, and that was a, that was the toughest year of my life financially uh, and professionally. So uh, she said, "I'm getting married," and I said, "Okay." <laughs> okay, so dad has to pay for the wedding, right? Well, I mean, Is that still a thing that dad's paying for the wedding? I helped. I helped a little. <laughs> right. Yeah, I did. And so then Conrad Thompson got in touch with me in 2017. He said, you want to do a podcast? I'm like, hell no, I don't want to do wrestling again. <laughs> and then Lola said to me, she said, you got to pay for that wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, let's do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and it started the ball rolling to where we are today. Yeah to podcasts and a very successful podcast, thanks to Conrad, and getting together with these people and getting an AEW. So yes, your wedding. Yeah, was and the, I think his kids are a big theme in his life of pushing him in the right direction, because he's an old drunk. <laughs> you don't realize how many he is. No, no, no. You are. Yes, you are. Okay. And I just remember we were all going out for sushi, and my bro older brother texted me, and he's like, there's rumors going around that dad been offered a position with WWE and or AEW and like all of us are saying go with Cody don't go back to the WWE oh I can talk <laughs> I can project like a Shivani <laughs> and it's interesting too because yeah one of the one of the what? always have to project your voice remember that yeah. 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 one of the one of the themes of the book of I said earlier about I think one of the reasons is as this book uh, comes out, you know, the kids on the backers get their books once they're free from the COVID cruise they're on right now, <laughs> sitting in the ports of LA. Uh, but also, it's uh, bookstores everywhere. Is that as much as this is a book steeped in wrestling, it's about that journey and it's about that process. And again, I keep going back because it's an Americana story. And there's several times in Tony's life where things get rough, things get difficult. And his response internally was always, well, now what am I going to do? And it's inspiring. And it's very inspiring. And again, the, the fact was not lost on me that us even putting this book together during a pandemic, you know, that same thing. It's like, we're going to do it on Zoom. We're going to sit around in our pajamas by the third call. You know, <laughs> right? that, you know. But there, there, that, 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 that undercurrent that Laura was talking about, that Tony was talking about, I think it's something that's going to resonate with a lot of people as they read it. And I think uh, I'm really excited for this book to be out on shelves. You know, we have advanced copies here, obviously. Uh, but to be out on shelves and to be out everywhere for people to see the story about, again, you know, uh, a wrestling announcer, but yet the huge impact that you have on, on everything and also just that that perseverance. And I think there's just a lot of inspiration to be taken from that. Yeah, Chris, I think one of the one of the, the points that really came home with me about uh, the story and my story was the success of the Kickstarter. Uh, that that can't be understated because or overstated. So it was amazing. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sixteen hundred four ninety one Tony. What was that again? Oh. <laughs> so when this all started and we talked about this, and Tony's like, "Well, how much? How much is you know? Does, is this going to raise? How much is it going to cost? Like, what are we asking?" And he said, "Well, Tony, it's a it's a pre order vehicle. Is essentially what it is." Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the initial. Um, Threshold was you know, thirty thousand dollars in ACD. Do you think we'll get that? Like, oh, we're we're gonna get that. Uh, I'm confident of that. Like, and I think we're gonna beat the record. He's like, we talked about. He said, well, Jim Cornette had a Kickstarter and had a book that he put out, and it made sixty nine thousand four hundred and ninety dollars. Mm -hmm. So when we get sixty nine four ninety one, it's gonna be a victory, and you'll be the, the highest selling wrestling comic in Kickstarter history. And I think we'll get there. Uh, but I didn't. No, is that we would get there in like two and a half days. Oh, and we yeah. almost double that. Yeah. 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 Your fans, your fans, they all came out and they showed their support. Mm -hmm. And it was it was quite amazing. It was watching it. It was like, is this really happening? Um, how did that make you feel that so many people were like just so quick in a, in a pandemic to come out and just say this is this is what I need to do, I need to support you. It made me feel very proud of uh, of the effort that everyone on this 
on this table and Travis with the source point put into this. It, it really made me feel proud of the other group. It really did. It didn't, as far as my life is concerned, you know, I, again, the way I feel is that I'm not so sure about me or my life story or that. They are, but I'm proud of the work that everybody did and that, that made me feel proud for the group. That's, that's my feeling. And we, we, you know, full, full transparency, I mean, you take the number to this panel, we might as well give you some inside dirt. We all had an internal number. I think our funding goal was 20,000. Kickstarter, you know, I have a lot of experience running Kickstarters and things like that. And one of the things I always tell people when they get Kickstarter is one, it's not free money, mm. right? <laughs> it's a pre-order. Chris, you don't give very well, you know, you know, it's not free money. And two, uh, it's meant to kickstart the, the creation of a book, right? And I really use it as a pre-order window and things like that, like Mike said, you know, so there's a way to pre-order this book and we can reward the early adopters. We can reward people that, that support this book up front, sight unseen, largely. Uh, you know, I mean, we have preview art from John and Sally and DJ and some other people, things like that. But largely it's like, this is the thing we're doing and if you want to jump in on this, we're going to hook you up. We'll give you a hard cover, a variant cover by Scott James, all the stuff we're going to do. SourcePoint Press has a number, I've got a number, Mike's got a number, things like that. And uh, it got to a point where all of you, all the people out there were backing this Kickstarter with such enthusiasm. We had to write and create more stretch goals. And while we were debating internally, is it going to be a pin? Is it going to be a this? Is it going to be a this? They were sur surpassing the numbers of where the goals were unlocked. So we had to like posthumously like, oh, by the way, you all just got this, and now we're working towards this. You know. Uh, that was at 85,000. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. That was like a weekend of like 85,000. Um, but I also want to give huge credit to Tony on this, because not only did the Shimani Army get totally activated on this, you know, but. They project. Yeah, you're right. They do, right? <laughs> but also, Tony, you are so good to work with through the whole process. And that is not always the case when you work with, with people that are celebrities. I mean, let's be honest. I know you like to hear it. Like, mm -hmm. you, know, you are. And Tony was such a team player. And oh my God, when we started, we talked early on. I said, you know it'd be cool, Tony? Maybe if we could get a couple of the, couple of the talent, the AW talent, to like cut a promo. Um, on the book, or put you over, or do whatever. <laughs> you open the floodgates on that. Open the floodgates on it, and, and, and I appreciate you doing that, and I appreciate the the enthusiasm, but it also demonstrated the goodwill that so many people had toward you as well. You know, I mean, MJF kind of promo. Of course, he shot all over the shot all over the <laughs> cross. But you want, you know. <laughs> I mean, this is what he does, really. No choice. But. Well, I went to these guys, and I said, listen. Do a little video of the book, or I'm not putting your ass over on TV. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Is he all okay with no, <laughs> Heal, heal, Shivani. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you going to name that like a new wrestling move, move the Kickstarter? That is a good idea. <laughs> I will throw that out and make Excalibur look silly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was over 135000 on a $20,000 fund goal. And again, we had, we had bets at the publisher that, uh, like, I was like, look, man, I think, we can, I think we're going to get, like, 70000 I think we can really, we can really go with this. We were betting steak dinners against each other. You know, I'm still waiting to get my steak dinner. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. Keep waiting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gonna be fried chicken. <laughs> All right, I got a bucket of KFC. Full disclosure, you freaking heel. <laughs> Every dinner that we've gone on these comic cons, Mike Dawkins is paid for. That is so true. <laughs> I'm not about getting three meals. Oh, no, 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 I get it from Mike. I want one from SourcePoint. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Like Mike always takes care of us, right? This is this is the, this is this is aspiring to what what publishers ever should aspire to. You're like Mike, coordinating this project and helping us arrange the talent, and then rewarding all of the talent for the work that we do. And and then also, you gave uh, 
so many artists work during a time when they really needed it, not just yeah. personally. They gave so many people, and because it was a tough time during, you know, finding work. Oh yeah. Conventions, you don't have anywhere, you know, to do, so you have to like really be innovative, and mm -hmm. so getting that call was. Like, yes. Well, you know, yeah, and it's a good point because one, I mean, lest we forget, like the comic comic industry largely shut down during all of this as well. And you're right. And one of the things I was so fortunate to uh, to be able to do was, and again, Mike gets a lot of credit for this. We're talking about it, do this breaking it up into chapters and ten initiatives, ten ten page chapters. I immediately went back to my horror anthology roots. I love the old horror anthologies, you know, like people who read my work like Nightmare World, which is an apple, part of the like, you know, <laughs> hate, doesn't hate, but, but the emotion that Tony is probably feeling right now. Um, okay. <laughs> no, but I love the idea of getting to work with different artists on a book. And to me, in all seriousness, knowing that a lot of people who have never read a comic book before would be investing in this. I really wanted to demonstrate to people who have maybe not seen a comic book in years, maybe never seen a comic book, the spectrum of, of talent and styles and, and diversity of creators and creatives that you can do in a book like this. So what we ended up doing was uh, the 10 different chapters, each one is by a different artist on our team. And I was very fortunate that by and large, my, my first round of picks all the way went through, you know, getting home with the job, you know, Long time friend of mine, and, and getting all the Sally, who's a, a long time friend and collaborator of mine, but also getting to work with some artists that I never got to work with before. And it was so funny approaching them like, I have this project, it's a 10 page chapter, and I really can't tell you what it's about until you sign the NDA, <laughs> but it's going to be a big deal. Do you trust me on this? That I know that you will do a good job on this. Uh, in fact, the only person we didn't get. Uh, was someone that, that uh, our publisher recommended, great artist. The reason we ended up not getting him is he said, Dark Games, I want to do this project. I, I was in, I got to back out. I got another big gig, and I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> like, sure about script play. Uh, he's currently drawing Spawn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> no, no shame in being second place to Spawn. Time. I'll go for it. <laughs> but you know, it, it was fun, and, and I'm really excited now for all these. Uh, for people to see the variety of styles in the book and stuff like that, it was it was cool. It's cool to work with well, again, work with your friends during the pandemic. You know, I mean, it's you have to make a little money too. So, so was it more difficult when you draw real people than when you're drawing? You, yes. yes. <laughs> Do you feel nervous? Uh, no, I mean, I worked at uh, off of a lot of reference, and the guys at Source Point. Had uh, somebody that was that gave us good reference, so they, they did a good job giving me everything I needed. Of course, uh, I looked up some stuff myself, but yeah, it's definitely hard to do real people. I'm more of a probably monster than I am. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, like I said, it, it, the book came out great. Um, I'm, I was glad to be on it. Probably was the crappiest artist on there that's saying something. <laughs> you don't believe it. That book came out beautiful. Mike was, Mike was huge with the references. Like, it would be Dirk would be, I'm like, what color was this? And two seconds later, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were, there were a couple so times fast. when I had a call there, like, oh, and within uh, not even an hour, I'd get it to There you go. Right. Yes. Yeah. Tony's yeah. wearing an orange shirt. Uh, <laughs> Sam <Sailing> never. <laughs> Sam. I've never hated Sam in so much <laughs> Uh, do you want to give questions in just a couple minutes? Um, and uh, so, uh, do you have any uh, final thoughts on, I mean, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but that you want to like share with anybody about this book and uh, what it means to you and how? Yeah, I'm, I'm just very proud, Christy, of this. I'm, uh, I'm so, I, I have been to C2E, this is my third C2E2. Mm -hmm. But this is, and, and I've been here signing autographs before, but this is the first C2E2 that I feel like, man, I'm part of this. I'm part of the, I'm a part of the comic world now. How cool is that? <laughs> I mean, that is, 
for you out there, I mean, if somebody would come to you and say, hey, be part of this kind of world, you know, you would go, yeah. <laughs> so this is this is the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. And it's uh, it's really a, a, a point of the greatest time of my life. And uh, so that's what I want to say. Thank you, David. And, and again, Travis, you guys at Source Point are awesome. You really, really are. You're good people, and you you helped us out a great deal. And so, thank you again. Yeah, and again, being a lifelong fan of wrestling, this was really an honor to work on this project. You know, I, I, I get, uh, the word blessed gets overused a lot, but yeah, I really it, do. Yeah. it does. But I mean, this was really, I mean, what a wonderful opportunity. Um, Tony talks in the book a lot about, you know, the, the subtext of just being, being there and doing the work and being present and willing to put it in. Um, this book has opened so many doors. You know, not only was it, again, the, the highest funded wrestling comic in crowdfunding history, it is also the first original graphic novel ever advertised on cable television. That's amazing. And props to Tony Khan, too, for, you know, again, you know, a little inside dirt real quick, we'll get the Q&A. When Tony took us backstage at one of the AEW events and we were meeting all the talent, Tony Khan came over and, and Tony introduces Tony Khan, and he was excited about the Kickstarter and things like that. And he would, you know, and he's just been an amazing sport. I mean, to have a book, comic book, advertised by him on cable, Marvel, no offense, Marvel and DC don't get that. <laughs> Tony Schiavone gets that. Yeah. 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 Um, so if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask any of uh, the group, we would love to answer them. Hello, Tony. Yes, sir. So, um, you know, over your time in WWF and WCW, you got to work with some of the greatest talent in the wrestling industry right. during that time. So my question would be, who was the greatest, and why was Bobby Gray Heenan? <laughs> <laughs> Bobby Gray Heenan was one of the. And there's a uh, there's a chapter in there, one of the bonus chapters about Bobby Heenan, and about not Bobby not the Bobby Heenan that you saw on TV, but the Bobby Heenan that we knew and traveled with, because Bobby Heenan was one of the greatest uh, pranksters ever. <laughs> he thought of this stuff all the time. Um, but yeah, he is one of the greats. Jesse Ventura is one of the greats that I work with, obviously. I was so thrilled to be able to work with Jesse because I watched Saturday night's main event with he and Vince McMahon, which I thought was just a wonderful period of time.
thrilled to be back in the wrestling business. I know we disappeared off the screen for quite a while, and uh, we're both glad to be back. I hope you guys are enjoying the product. <laughs> Take it or leave it. Eat the shit or spit it out. We're still feeding it to you. Tony Khan listens to you guys. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, Tony, what I want to do, and everyone up there from uh, our new family, I just want to wish us all a lot of luck. I've been asked a few times when you're going to write an autobiography. It's yeah. probably never, maybe much more down the road with my son being involved in the business, but this is a way to kind of write one without writing one, and I'm excited as I can be. Please support us when that thing comes out. Didn't want to step on Tony's toes, but he's been kicking ass, so congratulations. <laughs> Gotta go to Charlotte. Sorry. <laughs> Quickly, we met and got married. 
uh, and uh, said we we just celebrated 40 years together. So she's been with me the entire the entire run of this of my professional career. She said to me one time, she said, I feel bad because. You always wanted to be a Major League Baseball announcer, which was always my goal. And once we got married and started having children, you went into wrestling because wrestling was more lucrative. And it was because of me and having a family that you got into pro wrestling. I said, absolutely not. I got into pro wrestling because I love pro wrestling. And I would have done it with or without you guys here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so anyway, that's kind of the story there. But I digress. Go ahead. Hey buddy, how you doing? Good. Um, so, uh, what's, uh, that of the Bloods and Seeds is obviously one of the most famous calls you've right. ever had. Um, yeah. and, and for the title of the book, was there ever anything else in contention of the Bloods yeah. and Seeds? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a loaded question. Yeah. It was uh, everybody to my right wanted Bloods and Seeds, and I did not. <laughs> not because I'm upset about Bloods and Seeds, but I thought that maybe that. It's just not the right thing that I didn't want. I didn't want this book to be just look at the book and say, "Oh yeah, the big Foley thing." I wanted the book to be about my career. Uh, and again, I, I've said it before, I wanted the book to be called "I Jabroni." <laughs> <laughs> That's what I am. Right? I'm a guy that puts over other people. Uh, but then I got to thinking, you know, I know The Rock has made you running kind of famous. Mm -hmm. So uh, I we went with butts and seats. Yeah, and, and it was a probably the most nervous I had ever been talking to Tony, getting him on a call. But you know, it's always a process sometimes. That's all right. Mm -hmm. No, you're getting on the phone saying, "So I kind of want to talk to you about the title of the book." And he goes, "Yeah, I've really been thinking about this. I just wrote thing." And, and like you said, I'm like, "Well, you know, there's this guy called The Rock that kind of made that famous." <laughs> Immediately he got on the iron cheek, but still. <laughs> and I immediately like went in this non-stop ramble box. So what do you think about bunch of seats? And here's yeah, can you I ramble? <laughs> and here's why. But as I kind of pitched it to Tony, the first chapter of the book, he's buying tickets for his family to go see professional wrestling. Mm. He was putting butts in seats, mm. literally. His job as an announcer is to put butts in seats. Though there was that famous call, you know, one of the most famous moments in wrestling, you know. Folk, you know, during the wars, the wars, during the war, the Bunsen Seeds call. And not even now, the reason being brought back in AEW, what he learned from his legacy was having Tony Giovanni on Holiday Wrestling will put Bunsen Seeds. Mm -hmm. And he bought that hook, line, and sword. <laughs> <laughs> we had this phone call, we had this conversation. Yeah. Tony was not entirely convinced yet. Oh, well, you know, let's put a button in that. We, we can talk about that further. Right. And that week was the anniversary of that match. Yes. Oh, right. And it blew up on Twitter. And Mick, I think, reached out to you, right? Didn't Mick? Well, tweeted each other. Yeah, Mick sent a tweet out. says, I'll never will forget something about the, one of the greatest moments in, in my career. And I retweeted it and said, I was happy to be a part of it. <laughs> uh, and, and we were at Astronomicon in Ann Arbor. And Mick and I got together and talked. And, and uh, Mick said, I want to thank you and JR for what you did for my careers. Your call that night and JR's call about my guy killed a man, you know, when he <laughs> and The Undertaker had the cage match. I feel good about that. Mick was a friend and I feel good that in this in, in the scheme in the scheme of me being a WCW guy and he working with the WWE, I kind of feel bad that in effect that they wanted me to quote unquote shit on what was going on on Raw at that time. And that's the, the word I came up with. I could have come up with something else, which would have probably lasted through time as well. I feel bad about that, but I feel good that maybe I helped a guy who is a quality person mm -hmm. and one of the biggest stars ever in our sport, I helped his career. I feel good about that. I really do. So to me, butts and seats is not a negative connotation. It may be a negative connotation if you look at it through the, through the scope of the Monday Night Wars, but in reality it's not. And there's a whole chapter devoted to that night. Hmm. The book. So, yeah. thanks for the question.
Thank you. Probably going to be our last question. No pressure. Uh, it's an easy question, I think. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us this weekend, Tony. Uh, you would call a dream match between one like Jim Crawford promotion talent yeah. and one all elite wrestling talent. What wow. dream match would you call? Wow. wow. <laughs> that that's really good. I think I think Ricky Steamboat and Kenny Omega would have a great match. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ever. I mean, there's so much about Ricky Steamboat uh, to love and the fact that he could sell and the fact that he could do so many great things. And Kenny Omega, to me, is... I've never seen Kenny Omega and AEW have a bad match. Mm -hmm. I've seen Kenny... I've seen some of his matches better than others, mm -hmm. but every match he's had has been the best match. So I think that would be it. I really do. Good choice. Phenomenal. Okay, well, that's a good note to end that on. So, yeah. everybody, thank you so much. Uh, Source Point Press booth, you can pick up the book. Um, and we got our we got our we got our own place too uh, near the AEW booth. Yeah, here in Tony's aisle two hundred, aisle two hundred. Two ninety eight. the book and bobbleheads. Two ninety eight. Two ninety eight. Two ninety eight. So you can go and check him out there. Dirk is at. H Artist Alley H8. So I'll have books and seats there as well as a bunch of other books. If you'd like to come check that out, it would be appreciated. And then the the, Source Point Press. The, the, how to remember Dirk is H8 is hate. It's very on brand. I hate Dirk Manning. <laughs> <laughs> Which I really don't, but it's easy to remember. Well, it's like, it, embrace the hate. Right? <laughs> and Christy, thank you. It's always great seeing you, yes. sweetie. You've helped out a great deal with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. For